So Kademlia is a distributed hash table implementation and it is used as an overlay network for BitTorrent. Instead of talking about micro details and how it is used in BitTorrent, today we spend time understanding Kademlia in depth. In this video, we take a super detailed look into distributed hash table implementation and we would see how it can power the routing of requests without having any central authority. We look at how data and nodes are represented how it leverages XOR as a distance function and how it always converges to the node that we are looking for. But before we move forward, I'd like to talk to you about a course on system design that I've been running for over a year now. The course is a cohort based course, which means I won't be rambling a solution and it will not be a monologue. Instead, a small focused group of 50-60 engineers every cohort will be brainstorming systems and designing it together. This way, we build a solid system and learn from each other's experiences. The course to date is enrolled by 600 plus engineers spanning 9 cohorts and 10 countries. Engineers from companies like Google, Microsoft, GitHub, Slack, Facebook, Tesla, Yelp, Flipkart, Dream11 and many 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 more have taken this course and have some wonderful things to say. The coolest part about the course is the depth we go into and the breadth we cover. We cover topics ranging from real-time text communication for Slack to designing our own toy load balancer to Greek buzzes live text commentary to doing impressions counting at scale for any advertisement business. In all, we would cover roughly 28 questions and the detailed curriculum uh, split week by week can be found on the course page which is linked in the description down below. So if you are looking to learn system design from the first principles, you will love this course. I have two offerings for you. The first one is the live cohort based course which you see on the left side and the second one is the recorded course which you can see on the right side. The live cohort based course happens every two months and it will go on for eight weeks while the recorded course contains the recordings from one of the past cohorts as is. If you are in a hurry and want to binge learn system design, I would highly recommend you going for the recorded one. Otherwise, the live cohort is where you can participate and discuss things live with me and the entire cohort and amplify your learnings. The decision is totally up to you. The course details, prerequisites, testimonials can be found on the course page arpitbhairi.me slash masterclass and I would highly recommend you to check that out. I put the link of uh, the course in the description down below. So if you are interested to learn system design, go for it. Check out the link in the description down below and I hope to see you in my next cohort. Thanks. So to get information about the peers, a node in a BitTorrent talks to a central entity named Tracker. Tracker keeps track of all the peers participating in the torrent, sees how much they have uploaded, downloaded and whatnot. Any peer who joins the network talks to this tracker to see ke, hey, give me 50 random peers to talk to and then the peers talk among themselves and then download and distribute the file. But there is still a central entity tracker who keeps track of all the peers that are participating in the torrent. Now, given that we have a central entity in the system, two things could happen. First. It could go down. So if a tracker goes down, the entire torrent collapses. Second, because it's a central entity, it's prone to attack. So attacker could just attack this one central entity and retrieve all the information that they need or they can take down the torrent. So in either case, this hybrid P2P implementation might be sufficient in most cases, but not good in a lot. So can we go pure P2P implementation in which there is no central authority or no central entity to keep track of anything, right? And which is what we discussed today. We talk about something called as Kademlia. So BitTorrent uses something called as an Kademlia as an overlay network, right? So there is, so if yeah, BitTorrent can be implemented with a central entity called Tracker or, you, or it can go pure P2P with, by using an overlay network uh, that is implemented using Kademlia, right? So Kademlia, what it is? So Kademlia is an implementation of a distributed hash table. Hash table, simple key value pairs, right? But if one node is not enough to handle a lot of data, what do we do? We distribute it across the node. It's not just about storing large amount of data, but also about having a pure P2P implementation of it. So we would have a lot of nodes in our network and they are all storing some bunch of key value pairs. Right? Now what we need to do, the beauty of this is there is no central entity. Now the request, let's say I want to get a particular key value pair. Request can come to any node and that node needs to know who to talk to to reach to the node that holds the particular key value pair. 
And this sort of routing and networking is the overlay network that I'm talking about, right? Instead of going deep into BitTorrent part of it, we'll talk about just a raw distributed hash table implementation, which you can leverage and extend across hundreds of use cases out there, right? Okay, so to start our understanding of a pure P2P DHT implementation, we start with representation. So how is every node and a key participating in this DHT, in this distributed hash table, they are represented by. Okay, so every node or every data in this uh, DHT implementation is uh, gets a unique 160 bit or 20 byte ID. Now this is a unique ID, unique. There is no overlapping that could happen, but this unique ID would uniquely identify either a node in the system or a peer in the system or the key in the system, like the key value pad that you are storing. So key or node. So basically how you can get it, you can take the node IP, pass it through the hash function and the ha and uh, it would spit out a SHA-1 uh, 160 byte, uh, 160 bit hash. Or you can take the key that you are storing, pass it to the hash function, you get 160 bit hash. So the overall idea is the representation would ensure that everyone who is participating in the network gets this 160 bit or 20 byte unique ID. Right? And this becomes the, the way for us to locate an object. Right? Okay. Now we talk about ownership. Now that we have assigned IDs to the keys and the node who would own a particular key. So any network, any pure P2P implementation needs to first solve the problem of ownership as in given a key, given a node or given a key and a set of node, which node would this key reside on, right? This is called the ownership problem. So we have the hash, we have the unique ID of the key and the node. Now, what we could do is we could say that, hey, the node that is the closest to the key owns the particular key. We can say that, right? But then given that we have IDs assigned, how would we know, right? How would we know which is the closest node, right? And this is where we need a way to define the distance metric. Now, this is not a linear scale or a physical distance that you can say, hey, this is this much far and this is that much far, right? So there has to be a very smart way to define a distance metric that would help us tell, ki, hey, for this particular key, out of this three N nodes or, or out of this three nodes, node one is the closest one. So my key K1 would be placed at node N1, right? To do this comparison, you need something called as a distance metric. So what's a distance metric? <clears throat> In order to find a closest node, we need a distance metric that quantifies the closeness, obviously. Now, for any, you, uh, for any uh, Euclidean geometry, what we need is we need or any distance metric needs to satisfy three requirements. First of all is distance of the point to itself is equal to zero. Right? It cannot be positive. It cannot be 1, 2, 3, something. Distance of x, comma x is equal to 0. Right? Second, distance of x, comma y is greater than 0 if x is not equal to y for all x and y. Basically, distance between any two points should be greater than, uh, should be greater than 0 if the points are different. So, it cannot be negative or 0. It could be 0 only when both the points are same. And the third is called as a triangle, uh, third one is called as a triangle inequality, which says that distance from x to y plus distance from y to z is greater than equal to distance of x to z. Now, this means that basically the shortest distance between the two points is always the straight line connecting them, right? It's a very simple way to put it this way. So, the three points can form a triangle, it would still hold to x, y, y, z and x, z, x, z should be smaller or equal to the summation of the other two. While if all the three points are collinear, then x, y plus y, z should be less than equal or uh, uh, x, y plus y, z should be greater than equal to x, z, right? Classic, classic three conditions to meet our 
basically distance function. So we can, so this gives us this freedom. Like given that this is not a physical world where you could measure the distance in meters and kilometers. Here, what we could do, what we have to do is we have to define a metric or a function that satisfies this three requirement. Right? So what Kademlia uses? Kademlia uses a brilliant approach. Kademlia uses XOR, raw, simple, fast, efficient XOR function in order to define the distance between the two nodes. So distance between X comma Y is equal to X XOR Y. Right. So the two IDs that we got, 160 bit each, we just take the raw XOR of it and the integer represented by that becomes the distance between the two nodes. So this is such an efficient implementation because it is not, you don't have to do explicit measurement, keeping track of things and whatever. It's just raw, simple XOR function, very efficient to compute repetitively even. Right. And now let's see if XOR actually satisfies all the three requirements. First was uh, distance between X and X is equal to zero. Distance function is XOR for us. X, XOR, X, one XOR, one, like when two are same, XOR gives out zero. So D of X comma X is equal to zero, satisfied. Second, D of X comma Y should be greater than equal to zero. So X, XOR, Y is definitely greater than zero because there is no sign bit compared, so it, it basically cannot become negative. So it's zero, uh, it's basically greater than zero, so that's satisfied. Third is distance of x comma y plus distance of y comma z is greater than equal to distance of x comma z. Now, distance of x comma y is x, x or y. Distance of y comma z is y, x or z. So x, x or y, x or y, x or z. So y, x or y cancel out to zero. And so it becomes x, x or z. And it, and it actually satisfies the third requirement is distance of x comma y plus y comma z is greater than equal to equal to as important greater than and equal to distance of x comma z. So it satisfies all the three requirements that we wanted from our distance function, which is basically a simple Euclidean geometry. Right. So this shows that we can use XOR as a distance metric. Right. And which is exactly what Kadebia uses. Okay. Now that we know we have <coughs> defined ownership, we have defined a distance metric. Now let's visualize this distance and why it is important because it would help you define routing. So <coughs> given that we have distance metric based on XOR, I would say how we can visualize it. Visualizing it could be like if it was a physical distance, I could just plot it with XY coordinates on the graph and do that. But here it's XOR. XOR is very different. It's not like regular distance metric. So how do we do it? <clears throat> so here to simplify the things, instead of taking 160 bit representation, I'm taking four bit representation, right? So the unique values would range from zero to 15, both inclusive, right? So let's say my node N1 has an ID of 15. 15 is one, 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 one. My key uh, my node N2 is having ID of 5, so 0, 1, 0, 1, right? And my key KA has ID of 6, 0, double, 1, 0, right? So when I have this, so in order to find which node owns the key KA, I have to take, I have to find distance from KA to N1, KA to N2, right? Once I have the distance, I can compare with whichever one is the smaller, I'll go there, right? So distance between KA and N1 comes out to be 9. Distance of KA and N2 comes out to be 3. So KA owns by N2. Right? So here, when we do an XOR, the property of XOR that when we are basically when we are computing the distance, we are doing an XOR of the two numbers. Right? The property of XOR is when the two bits are same it spits out zero. If they are different, it spits out one. So when I'm XORing the two numbers, what I'm doing is so long as my most significant bits are same, it the output would be zero, 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 zero. As soon as it would start to differ, I'll get output one. So, so for the common prefix, the distance, so basically, 
more common the prefix between the two IDs, the smaller would be the distance. Because if my key and my node, the ID of them, if they differ at the first, at the most significant bit itself, then it would output to one. And because it, the output is also 160 bit in uh, 160 bit string, the most significant bit would be set to one. So distance would be longer, right? Given that XOR has this property, we, would, we can confidently say that more common the prefix between the two IDs, the smaller the distance, right? So because if the prefix is same, what would happen? They would all start to, when you do XOR, bitwise XOR, it would start to split 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. As soon as the first differing bit comes up, the output would be 1. So common the prefix, smaller the distance. This is such a beautiful way to visualize it. And it's all there in the research paper. Like I loved it when I was trying to understand. Highly, highly, highly recommend you to go through that as well. And so common the prefix, smaller the distance. Now this would give you this hint key. Right? Prefix. Prefix, I want to store it somewhere. The first thing that would come to your mind is, hey, can I store it in a tri data structure? Exactly. So that's a very good way to visualize it. So what if we create a binary tree, a complete binary tree, where let's say I'm using with four bits, right? So I'll have a binary tree of level four. So let's say left subtree is one, right subtree is zero, and I continue to do it across all the depth. So my node N1, whose ID was 15 is represented by 1, 1, 1, 1, right? So in my complete binary tree, I traverse 1, 1, 1, 1. I'll, the final, the leaf node would be where my N1 stays. Similarly for key, similarly for uh, key A and then N2. And here when you put it into the complete binary tree and you place it there, you can very clearly see that N1 and KB are close to each other while Ka and N2 are close to each other. So the XOR metric that we were talking about, it, hey, how would we identify, how would we do that? Here, it gives a very clear visual way to look at, hey, these two are actually close to each other, right? So we can visualize the distance metric that we were talking about in a try. Now, this would help us with routing and that's the brilliant part of this algorithm, okay? Given that we sorted this, or uh, given that we put it into a complete binary tree, but if you look at this, that if I have 160 bit that and I'm unnecessarily creating a complete binary tree, it's a waste of time, space, and resource. Don't do that. So instead, we, instead of having a complete binary tree, we create the path as needed. So for example, if I have my node N1, that is, ID 15, it would be 1, 1, 1, 1. But if I have not seen any key that is 1, 1, 0 something, I can just place my N1 into the, into the shortest path possible, right? So this way, for the four examples that first, so, uh, let's say if I take examples of seven different entities, right? N1 is 15, K is 6, N2 is 5, KB is 13. KC is 8, KD is 9, and N3 is 1. Now, if I want to place this, instead of having a complete binary tree, what we would have to do is we would just place it as at the smallest height possible, right? Such that it, that it disambiguates itself from the other nodes. Right. So instead of having the entire, like instead of you needing to travel entire 160 bit, just keep it at the shortest disambiguated path possible. Right. And that's the idea. This way you would save space and you would be reaching to the point much, much, much faster. Right. So with this, you and also if a particular subtree does not have any node or any key placed in there, you don't even need to construct it. So just keep it bare minimum, the essential that you need, everything else you can discard, right? Okay, given this as a representation, now let's talk about routing. Now this would make routing much, much, much fun. Okay, so given that there is no central entity in the system, how would you know where to go to, right? So let's say if you would want to fire get key K5 
and you fire this request to node n1. Node n1 holds 1, 2, 3, like key 1, key 2, key 3. And you requested key 5. The request came to node 1. Now node 1 needs to know where this request should be forwarded to. Right? So that's where node 1 needs to have some sort of routing table that knows where to go to. But every peer or every node cannot know about every other node. Because if it does, then if you have thousands and thousands of nodes, then every node needs to know about every other node. So memory consumption would increase. Plus, if any node leaves the system or joins the system, someone has to broadcast this information. It's too much complicated. Right? So somehow, you need to find where to send this request to. Right? So this is where the routing uh, strategy would come in. So let's talk about that. So <clears throat> every node in the network would keep a track of a few neighboring nodes right and it would hope that everyone else in the network also does so so for example i might keep track of few nodes so if if i'm being requested key 5 and i don't have it but either i might know a node that has it or a node that is closest to the node that would have it so somehow i need to know where to forward the request to right and this is what the key problem that your routing needs to solve that no matter which key is requested it would always take you in the right direction and take you to the node that would store the corresponding key that you are looking for right okay so here, when you say, hey, my every node will keep track of few neighboring nodes. Imagine every node taking care of like randomly picking nodes. It would not converge. You cannot guarantee conversions if you are just picking nodes at random and just saying, hey, you keep these five nodes, you keep that five nodes. There has to be a strategy behind it. right? And this strategy is what the core routing logic comes in. Right? Okay, so what's the core idea? The core idea of this is the visualization that we did with try that would come in handy. So, hear me out. Every node in the network knows at least one node in each of the subtree that it is not part of. Right? So, for example, if I'm talking about node n1, which is at, which is having the 4-bit ID as 0, 1, 0, 0. Right? 0, 1, 0, 0. That's the ID of node n1. So, node n1 would need to keep track of three subtrees that it is not part of. Which are these three subtrees? Because its ID starts with 0, so the entire subtree that starts with 1, it needs to have at least, it needs to have contact in at least one of the node in that gigantic subtree that starts with 1. Right? Then n1 was 0, 1. So given that it starts from, Z, it has a prefix of 0, 1, the subtree that it left out is 0, 0. So it would need to have at least one contact in 0, 0. The entire subtree that starts with 0, 0, any one, any one node, any uh, a contact with any one node in this subtree is fine. Right? Then it has 0, 1, 0. So which means the subtree that is left is 0, 1, 1. So it needs to have one contact in subtree that has prefix 0, 1, 1. It needs to have one contact here. And then 0, 1, 0, 0 is where n1 is stored. So 0, 1, 0, 1 is where it needs to have one more contact. So basically, if there are 160 bits, sorry, let me take here. If there are four bits in the system, your, there are four, uh, if, sorry, if your ID is four bit long, you would have contact in four subtrees. Right? If you have 160-bit ID, you would have contact in at least, or you need to have at least one contact in each of the subtree that you are not part of. Right? So this way, wherever, if the request comes in for anything, you would have a place to route your request to, and which is what is needed with a good robust routing strategy. Now with this in place, let's look at how routing would happen, and this is the most beautiful part of Kademlia. I loved it. Like, I cannot even express how excited was I when I got to understand and write a small prototype to implement this. It's beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. So now, if let's say I have 
my uh, let me take a very let me take a very concrete example over here so let's say we are node n1 which is stored at 0 0 0 0 which is the extreme right node in my uh, in my uh, network right or in this binary tree right extreme right node and i have n2 where i have to talk to i don't know n1 doesn't directly know n2 right but i want a key that is there with n2 and n2 is 1111 which is the extreme left node right so now here because they don't directly know each other we need to have a way to route the request so now what you can do is you can slowly and steadily start to converge right so the idea is when you start with n1 which is 0000, 0, 0, 0 what it would have is because you know that you want to go to 1111 so from 0, 0, 0 to 1111 what you know that i don't have to like i have to definitely go to the subtree that starts with one you would have one contact let's say you have contact with node na that is placed at 1 0, 0, 0. suppose you have a contact there you would need to have contact in one of to at least one of the node in that subtree let's say that node is na which is 1 0, 0, 0. So you would forward your request to 10000, right? You'll reach NA. Then NA would know ki, hey, hi, I am NA, which is 1000, and this request needs to be forwarded to whom? 1111. So it would find a contact in a subtree because it is not part of, in the subtree that it is not part of, it would be 11, right? And this node would have a contact in that subtree because it's 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 uh, it's it's responsibility to have it right so this node might forward your request to nb which is sitting at 1101 because it is part of that subtree 11 it would forward the request to and then let's say this nb node directly has a contact with n2 which is 1111 so it can directly send your request to n2 and this is the beauty of this design that you would always converge to the node that you are looking for because every node keeps every node in its routing table would have information about the node that at least one node that it is not part of its own subtree and this is the brilliant of XOR metric if you are confused work out with this example and if you take an example you'll understand it in very much depth on how this beautiful routing has happened okay one clarification when i say it would route the request it would forward the request it does not mean that i make a request to this node and that node makes a request to other node it would send back the ip and you would make another request right understand it well that it's not that it's acting as a reverse proxy slash load balancer no your forward the request uh when i say forward it would it's just a routing table right so it would give you the ip address of the machine that you need to talk to right and so on and so forth right so the responsibility of the node is to either give you the key value that you're looking for or give out the ip address of the machine where you can go to right that's how it would work so here because of the enforcement that we did that every node needs to have a contact to at least one node in all the subtrees that it is not part of this means that we would always converge upon the node that we are looking for without ever digressing and this is such a beautiful deterministic routing logic in a pure p2p network i loved this idea highly recommend you to draw this and solve it on your own but you would love it when you would understand it right okay so now given this what we know that each node would need to keep track of a small subset of nodes that it would talk to and it would put it in its routing table so kademlia imposes or, or basically kademlia works on a udp protocol but it's not a mandate and then it's an idea you can use tcp udp webrtc whatever you want to use it like it's up to you right but the official paper says that hey ip udp port and node id which obviously you need to have ip and node id with you but udp tcp it's up to your implementation right so there is no one's forcing you to use a particular protocol over here right but it promotes udp uh, to solve this because you don't need a persistent connection whatsoever right okay so this is what every node in 
your uh, every node in your network would be storing is IP address of the node that uh, IP address of the neighboring port, the port on which IP address of the neighboring peer, the port at which the peer is listening and the node ID of that peer so that you can hit that location very quickly. Right? Now you would say, Ki, Are, if I just store one node from each of the subtree, what if that node goes down? Which is where what Kademlia says is instead of storing one, they call it K buckets. So for each subtree, uh, for each subtree prefix that you are ensuring a connection to, what you need to do is instead of having one node, you would store K nodes for that. So for example, for our node N1, we might have a subtree prefix of one, where our node was 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. So our subtree prefix one, I would have three nodes. I would have three contacts in the subtree that starts with one. I might have three contacts in subtree that start with 0, 0, right? And so on and so forth. So the idea is instead of having one for each subtree, have multiple, have K buckets. It's called K bucket. I don't know why it's called bucket, but K bucket. So for each subtree, have K contacts in it, right? And each of the K bucket. So for each node, for each subtree prefix, the K bucket is sorted by time, which means that most recently seen item sits at the tail of it and the least recently seen sits at the head, right? So for each prefix, for each, sub, for each node, for each subtree prefix, the K bucket is sorted by time, most recent at the tail, least recent at the head, right? Now we defined a routing strategy, right? We know how it always converges. Now what the next responsibility that we would have is to keep this routing table updated because there is no central entity. If a node joins and leaves the system or a new path is taken, our routing table needs to be updated. How would it do it? So sim very simple idea. Whenever a node receives any message from any other node in the network, any other node in the network, it updates its appropriate K bucket with the node ID. Right. So for example, if I am node N1 and I never received a message from NA, if I receive that message, then I would update my routing table with NA's information in it into that corresponding K bucket. Right. So if a node for the first time talks to me, I'll make an entry into my K bucket. Right. This way, the routing table across the entire network keeps updated so long as there are messages flowing through the nodes. Right? If the messages are not flowing, the routing table would go still. You can't do much about it right? you, because you don't have a central authority. Right? Okay, but how? How do we update the K bucket list? Because K bucket has a limit of K in it. So whenever an entry is added or updated, it would always become the most recently seen entry. So it would move to the tail so that the least recently seen entry always stays at the head. So what do we do? If we receive a message, and if my K bucket is not full, I would add it to the tail of the uh, tail of the K bucket, right? So if the K bucket is full, right? So now what we have to do, we have to do something because K bucket is full when we have seen a new node. So now what do we need to do? The node to which the request or the message has come to, <coughs> we check for the least recently seen message or uh, least recently seen node. We would try to ping that node and see if it is alive. If it is alive, good. We would move that node to the most recently seen node and discard the new node that has come in. Right? If we do not get any response from the node, from the least recently seen node, what we would do is we would delete this node because it is not responding. We would add the new node to the tail of it. So we would eventually have the K bucket, but the least recently node is discarded because it did not respond. Right? And if it responds, if the new node responds, we discard the, sorry, if the least recently seen node responds, we would discard the new node that we are trying to make an entry to, right? So now you would see, ki, Are, this means, so basically what this beautifully exploits is that it is very much observed in a P2P network that if a node is online for a very long time, it would continue to remain online in the future. So the longer the node is online, higher the probability of the node is to uh, higher the probability of the node to remain online. Right? So K bucket exploits this because if 
I'm pinging a node and if that node is alive, I'm still retaining it in my K bucket. I'm not discarding it. I will be discarding the new node because it is very much possible that a node just join the system, does this thing for five minutes and then drops off. But if a node remains in the system for a very long time, there's a very high probability that it would continue to remain as is, right? And this is how it promotes or it increases its probability of, uh, of having good connections or having connections with good peers purely by statistics. Ki, aray, I'll just keep my K bucket such that the most recently seen node continues to as is. If my least recently seen node responds, I would keep it and discard the new node. Right? Okay. So now that we have defined routing, we understood, uh, so we understood distance, we understood routing, we understood how routing tables are updated. We saw how it always converges. Now but let's talk about a communication interface on how <coughs> on how two nodes in my Kademlia network talk to each other. And what they do is every node is requested to expose four RPCs. You can implement it however you want. Like it's just RPC is a very generic. You can implement it with REST. You can implement with the raw TCP, anything. It's just four, uh, four APIs that you need to expose. The first one is the ping. Ping, what it does, it, it probes the node to see if it is online or not. It would just use to update the key buckets. That's what it would use to. Uh, so the first endpoint that it exposes is ping, that a node pings the other node to see if it's online. Second is find node. Find node is your is an API that would, when you make a request to a particular node, it would help you find the node that you are looking for. So if I have two nodes, uh, sorry, if my request came to N1, right? Now N1, you fired find node to N1. N1 would fire find node to NA because N1 does not know about N2. N1 has the closest one as NA. It would fire the request find node to NA. NA does not have address of N2. So what NA would do is, uh, NA would respond with the node that are closest to N2 in its routing table. And this would go on. So eventually NA, like when you're talking to this, you would be in response getting either the actual node or, or the IP address of the actual node that you're looking for, or you would get the, the addresses of the K nodes that are closer to the node that you're looking for, right? So the node itself does not forward the request. It could use its route table to respond either the node that you're looking for if it has it, or return the node uh, or return the k closest node in your in its routing table right this is the find node implementation then find value find value is because it's a distributed hash table you need to expose like given a key give me the value so what it does is it is exactly like find node but your but the machine that holds the key would return the stored value rather than just saying hey i'm present at this ip address it would uh, send the, it would respond with the value that you're looking for, right? Again, a clarification or again, uh, just reiteration of that, that intermediate nodes do not forward the request. They respond with either the node that you're looking for, the value that you're looking for, or the IP address of 50 closest node to the node that you're looking for. It would not act as an intermediate forwarder, right? Okay. The lookup is a recursive. You can very clearly see that find node is a recursive process that you would continue to do it unless you find a node from one node and then you'd for, and then you'd basically node N1 not needs to talk to N2. N1 does not know how to reach to N2. N1 broadcast, N1 calls find node across all the, all the nearby nodes. It would then call to other, it would then call to other and so on and so forth, right? You would continue to look out for N2 until you find one, right? And this is what happens. So it's a very simple, it's a very simple recursive lookup that would power uh, the find node functionality, the find value functionality in a pure P2P implementation. Right. Now let's talk about storing of key value. How would we store uh, a value, a key value in the node? So the store RPC that would be exposed, it would instruct the node to store the key value in it. Use in memory hash table, whatever it wants, it would store the value store the key value in the corresponding node. So to store, now let's say you would want to store something, right? You would want to store a key value in this P2P network. You cannot, now implementations would vary, 
right remember diff like this is a generic dht implementation but however you would want to implement for your use case it's up to you right for example some use cases might say ki hey i would store this key value only at this one node i would not store it at any other node you might want to do that or in some cases you might want to just distribute your key value the same set of key values across the entire spectrum and it's totally up to you so implementation would change but idea would remain the same right so to store a key value pair a node locates k closest node and sends them store rpc request right so for example if i want to store a key value pair in my p2p network let's assume that i want to broadcast it information so that every single node that i could know of stores this information stores this key value pair so that even if a node goes down i still have my key value pair floating in the network somewhere so what you would do is when you got when any random node got a request to store a particular key value right what it would do is it would first broadcast the store rpc across all its closest node then they would broadcast then they would store and then broadcast the store rpc to their closest node and so on and so forth this could be one of the implementation right depending on your use case you can alter the implementation there is no hard bound the beauty of this was the distance metric the routing logic implementation is up to you like your use case your implementation right and this way what you would see is that a key value pair is stored across all the nodes in your network right okay so now the implementation again implementation of store varies for use case for example do you want to have a single copy of a key value or you want to have multiple copies of key value do you want expiration or not do you want to have a separate read write responsibility on nodes or not it there are so many variants of it you can just tweak something for your use case and work it around right some performance optimization is you can cache the key value pair throughout the chain for example if you are doing a lookup of a key value you would know that hey i got this key value like this is the closest node this is the closest node and so on and so forth you can then along that path cache the key value pair that you are looking for so that when the next time the request comes in for the same key because you would be traversing the same path you would not have to go to the target node you can just find your key value pair beforehand itself and you can just return it from there right so you can optionally cache the key value along the chain so that you don't have to always go to the to the target to the actual target node to get it it would be fairly distributed in the network right second if the node goes down the neighboring node because we are always broadcasting it if a node goes down some or the other node in the network would already have the key value pair that you have stored and this is a very good way to have a purely decentralized network no matter if node goes down or something happens you would still have your key value persisted across the network right and again the usage varies as per the use case so don't stick to it it says this and will only implement this understand the idea understand the beauty of kademlia is its routing strategy and the distance metric which is xor it's such a beautiful thing you can leverage you can plug it out put it at hundreds of other places and ensure that you have a pure p2p network and this is kademlia and obviously there are few other experimental part of it which i have not touched upon because it was very specific but this would give you that idea everything else is widely available on the internet this was hard to find i compressed say, three four, four research papers information into this i got an more importantly i wrote a very quick prototype on my local machine to see if it actually work and it does right again highly encourage you to write a prototype rather than just having theoretical knowledge of it and it's beautiful beautiful world out there of p2p networks explore it right okay so this was kademlia and this is what bittorrent uses to power its overlay network we did not go into the details of what exactly you the torrent network would store what apis would it fire and other things because those are specific to bit torrent not really a dht implementation dht required its dedicated video it's a very powerful concept extremely powerful p2p concept and i wanted to cover it for so long so this is pure dht implementation detail and nothing else how to use it on bit torrent 
you can find it on internet uh, because while you are implementing your own torrent seeder or tracker you would need that otherwise you would not but dhts is the foundational building block that you should definitely know of right so yeah that's it that's it for this video if you guys like this video give this video a thumbs up if you guys like the channel give this channel a sub this was the sixth video in the BitTorrent internal series and i'll see you in the next one thanks a ton Thank you.